Um, so <clears throat> let me just start by saying uh, it's been really tremendous to, um, to, to, to watch all the beautiful presentations that we see in this week. It's just really amazing to see all the use cases and the domains and all the different fantastic work that's being done. Um, so when you look back in time, you actually start to realize it's, it's been a while. Like we've been doing DSRS2 now actually for um, 17 years. And so time flies, as you can say. So today, um, Austin, McGee, and uh, myself, I'm Lars, um, have the honor of uh, taking the opportunity to kind of look back a little bit on the, on the history and reflect a little bit about what has happened and also about some of the lessons that we learned uh, over the years. And then after that, Austin is going to talk about the future. We're going to look at what's next for DHS2. We have a lot of exciting uh, new solutions and new ideas coming up. So, um, so stay tuned for that. <clears throat> so to begin with, I'm gonna have the very difficult task of explaining the history of DHS2 in five minutes. Probably cannot be done, uh, but let me try. So, and one of the key messages here is that it hasn't really been the way it is now all the time. You know, this is pretty new. The way things are now with product managers and, and, and you know, solution architects and JIRA and CI pipelines and things. It didn't really used to be like that in the, in the beginning. So the very, <laughs> the very first implementation of DHS2 um, actually took place in, in uh, Kerala in, in some Indian states back in uh, 2006. Um, and it was done by Bahisp India. And um, the systems were pretty, very much uh, standalone. This was before we had even internet in, in, uh, in India. So everything was offline. So the, the system was basically then um, written on a, CD, on a CD, a rewritable CD, um, and then shipped by motorbike to all the health facilities. So people were driving around and, and installing CDs in the, in the health offices. Um, we even had rewritable CDs, I can remember, because every time there was a bug, you had to write a new CD. Then you have to go and install it. So uh, I think it's safe to say that the whole thing was a lot more laborious now um, back then than what it is now. Um, this was also the first developer workshop that we had. And um, the core team, uh, well, the core team is actually what you see on that photo. I don't know if you can recognize uh, some of these people. We have uh, Abiyot on the left. He's been a fantastic uh, person for uh, BHS2 over the years. Uh, been there from the beginning. Uh, we have Bharat, who, who was the lead developer of HISP India at the time, and then some other guy on the on the side. If you don't know who he is. Uh, too much, um, can't even recognize him. Uh, and on the left there, we have um, the one and only John Lewis. I don't know if you count as a developer John, but uh, John has been very instrumental. Um, also, uh, John told me to say that that bottle on the photo has nothing to do with John. That was not him. All right, so from, from um, India, we moved to Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone was really the first African country where we implemented uh, DSS2. Uh, once again, it was standalone. So um, deployed on, on district servers. Um, and at the time, there wasn't any kind of fancy, you know, web apps and, and uh, dashboards and visualizations and these things. We only had data entry. Um, you could create data elements in Organets and look at data set reports. That was it, maybe download the PDF. That's what you could do at the time. So we had trainings, there was less to train on. We had, as you can see here, like data entry screen. That was remarkable, it looks very much the same as it does now, even the data entry module, I will say, but everything else has changed. Um, and once again, like the data was really then, um, you know, sent um, offline. So we had to basically then drive around to every district by, uh, by car, by a Land Cruiser. <laughs> um, and then you had to drive to a district, you made an export in XML, um, and then, took it onto your own laptop, you upgraded the WAR file, you, you, you got some feedback from the users, you, you did some training, and then you started driving again to the next district. Um, so, so needless to say, I was uh, quite laborious and uh, data timeliness uh, suffered a bit from, from all the driving. Um, and of course, in, in recent times, Sierra Leone also has now decent mobile internet coverage, so things have things have improved. Then we moved to Kenya. So Kenya was really the lo first large scale web-based implementation of, of DHS2. So this was the first national scale um, DHS2, I would say. And um, I would actually say that the timing was on our side. Um, during those years, the mobile internet really took off in, in East Africa. So 
you know, Jörn and I and, and Ula is just coming here. <laughs> um, we traveled around in the in the districts in Kenya, um, and we saw that you know people were entering data. When the Wi-Fi went down, people just picked up their dongle from their pockets, put it in their laptop, you know, and continued working as if nothing happened. And we were just amazed, um, and we thought that this is this is very good for us. This is a good a good timing. So we managed to actually then customize uh, and roll out DHS2 in Kenya fairly quickly for aggregate data. Um, and within something like six months, you know, people could actually then just enter data and, and look at reports. Um, I will say that in the um, during those years, like we had nothing like we have now in terms of CI pipelines and you know Q and A teams and beta testing and whatnot. Uh, we usually joke that um, we talk to the end users in the morning. We developed features uh, in the evening and at night, and then we pushed the production uh, at midnight. And then you made a silent prayer that things would work in the in the morning. So, yes, very very uh, agile at the time. Maybe a little bit too much. And then you know Uganda took on DHS2 and Rwanda and Burundi and all these countries. You know, you know uh, Ghana and South Africa, and the the, the ball started rolling essentially. Um, and a lot of countries in Africa and, and Asia started to use it. Um, so going to leapfrog a little bit. Then in 2013, uh, we got interest from a huge organization called PETFAR um, that looked at DHS2. And we also have Mark Dizella here today with us. Uh, he has done a fantastic job uh, stewarding the, the um, information systems of, of data of, of, of PEPFAR. Um, and PEPFAR took interest in DHS2, I will say, because it was used in, in so many countries, right? So many countries used it, and they thought, hmm, it might work for us. So we had a couple of years where you know there was a lot of uh, a lot of work day and night to uh, to uh, adapt DHS2 for for PEPFAR. We called it Datum for PEPFAR. A lot of um, a lot of aspiration and a lot of perspiration, as, as Mark likes to say. Um, and I think today PEPFAR is used by something like thirty-five-ish countries, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so that was a huge. Uh, we even had like trainings in, in Johannesburg. The apps went made ready. We developed apps at night and demoed in the morning. It was very stressful. All right. So around 2014, this is when uh, these two really started to become what I would call a, a global standard, right? So we had lots of people like traveling to Geneva and Kristen and Ula and, and Knut was even seconded. We even like gave Knut to WHO for a while. He, he worked there. Um, and that ended up with a official like collaborative center agreement with the WHO. Uh, we had many people uh, like Ula, Prosper uh, and others traveled to Atlanta to meet with the CDC. Uh, we have worked a lot with CDC on the global health security agenda. Um, other organizations, even Google showed interest, sent us an invitation um, for their Earth Engine workshop. And Bjorn made this amazing presentation uh, yesterday or was it the day before, um, where he showed all the cool stuff we can do with the Google Earth Engine even today. So that has been really a fantastic uh, collaboration. And then we had the um, DC2 Symposium in DC in 2014 that really kind of exposed these two to the NGO community. And then NGO started to become aware of it. Uh, and then the ball started rolling also on the US side. UNICEF also um, started using and you know, adopting these as two. All right, and since then, I would say the, the rest is history. Uh, as we've seen this week, there's so much going on. I think you guys know more, much more than I do about what's going on these days. Too much to cover uh, and the rest is history. So with all this history, I think it's time to kind of reflect a little bit on the on the lessons learned, like what have we learned from from all these years? And I'm I'm going to focus mostly on the software design now. I'm a, I'm a software engineer, so I'm, I'm going to focus uh, a bit on the software design here. So obviously, like generic design, accessibility in apps has really been uh, critical for us. So we like to talk about like generic design as a success factor. So when we went to Kenya in in East Africa, we quickly learned that. Uh, a lot of the countries in East Africa, they had the same challenges. We went to Kenya, solved a lot of problems, went to Uganda, faced a lot of the same problems, went to Rwanda, same problems. Um, and we saw that there was a lot of potential for reusing the same software. Right? We should not go back from, to scratch and build new software for every country. That would be very dumb. So we decided that we should try to make it very flexible, generic, reusable, so we can build on what's there uh, and take it forward like that. Um, the good thing with being generic is that it really uh, reduces maintenance costs. I think today it would have been totally impossible to support software for every country, right? From, from the core team side, that would have been unmanageable. So we decided to make a generic core software that could be used. 
the other thing with generic software, I would say, uh, which may be a bit underappreciated is that it really accumulates best practices, knowledge and solutions. So when you go to one country, uh, you work through a set of problems and you sort of solve the problems, you have you know, long nights, you work hard, you figure it out. Uh, when you go to the next country, that problem is more or less solved, right? And then you solve another problem in that country, you move to the next one. And in that journey, you really kind of accumulate uh, knowledge and solutions so that so the, the kind of the solutions are transferred country by country. And today I would say when countries today start to adopt these as two for like, especially for aggregate and events, it's fairly easy, right? They can get up and running quickly and start using the software because a lot of the problems and the challenges are kind of already solved. This is of course still problems, but the foundational ones are, are solved. And I would say like <clears throat> generic design, uh, of course, has the context dimension where you can use it across countries, across domains, across use cases. Um, you can also then think of generic design in a time dimension. So as you know, like everything tends to change over time. There will be new data sets, there will be new programs, there will, you know, forms will change, new requirements. Uh, you go from aggregate to individual. Um, the good thing with being very flexible and configurable is that you can do all of this without having to go back to the dev team and ask for changes in the software. You can do it yourself with the uh, configuration. And I think that has really been a critical success factor that even as time goes by, you can still do a lot. Yes, of course, there's new features to be built, but you can change the system fundamentally. Super quick history, I'm gonna be brief here now. Uh, super quick history of, of the design. So I will say that back in 2010, uh, we started to have this generic thinking, but there was no API, you know, there was no custom apps, no app platform. There was no way of, the only way to get the data out, you had to download to Excel, you know, so click on Excel and do whatever you wanted with it from, from there, <laughs> uh, which made it very hard to extend with features and hard to kind of integrate and extend for local uh, customization. So the only way to do this was to basically fork the entire thing. So you took the entire software, made a copy of it and made some changes. And even in India, I remember that they had almost like one DHS2 for every state, which you no, know, needless to say, got very hard to maintain. So we thought that we had a like, legendary discussion in Zanzibar, I think Ula and I, uh, smoking some water pipe or whatever it was at the time. Um, nothing else. And we started thinking that we really need something that could expose DSS2 to the world, right? So it's not like a product, it becomes something that people can build upon, right? So we decided to build an API. And in, in hindsight, I mean, this looks obvious, but APIs weren't really hot at the time. You know, this is like 11 years, 13 years ago, so, or 11 years ago. So, so it was like slightly novel at the time. Um, sounds obvious now. Um, and then we had, you know, Morton joined us. We had, you know, very good developers joining us, building up the team. We, we made the API more compre comprehensive and we started around 2016 to see more uh, web apps being developed. So people now started to make, you know, custom apps, uh, which was great. Um, only thing was, it was very complicated at the time, time consuming, they're still fairly low quality, no consistency. Everyone basically picked their own framework. So like whatever framework people preferred, they would pick. And the result was that the apps looks very, very, uh, not uniform, right? It was very different, no common look and feel. It looks kind of amateur. So, so we decided, or, or Austin came and joined us in around 2019. And I think his first reaction was, oh my God, what's going on? What are you guys doing? Uh, we need some consistency here. So he came up with this idea of the app platform. So the app platform is really the kind of the, app, the platform for building web apps. It brings some, some structure, some rigidness, and a common way of building apps, same framework, same style. So with this, the apps are now slightly starting to become more uniform. Uh, the quality goes up and cost goes down because now people don't have to spend two weeks just figuring out how on earth am I gonna approach this? You know, it's kind of given. Um, so that helps. And we see from, from around 2019, we see that most complex implementations now do custom apps. For every major country, there's now starting to become apps. So the thing is that even though now apps, I would say is a huge success overall, um, it can be better, right? Can be better. I think it's still complex, still a bit costly to build and maintain, still break. Um, so what we're working on now is really to create a shared uh, and reusable UI component library so that instead of having to reinvent the organic tree for the 100th time, you can basically then take the organic tree that we built and, and use that one um, to avoid kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, we also would like it very easy and, and cheap to build apps. So it just shouldn't cost a lot of money and take you know months or years. It should be quick. So um, 
we now would like to make it very fast so you can build custom apps that can even be thrown away when you don't want to use it anymore. The other thing we're working hard on is to allow for custom backend mic microservices, right? Um, this is to support what they call data intensive workloads. Um, there's a saying that when you have a hammer, you know, every problem looks like a nail. Um, and I will say without mentioning any names or anything like that is true for web app developers, because if you are a web app developer, you think that everything should be a web app. Um, and the result of that is that people build data intensive applications as web apps and they shouldn't really be. They build integration jobs as web apps and they shouldn't really be. So, so what we're trying to do now is really to support what we call custom backend microservices where people can build like apps on the backend, things that belong on the backend, like integration, data processing and computation that should sit on the backend. So that is, is coming, as I like to say. Okay, super quick on the methodology. So software methodology. Uh, you know, and if you've been around in IT for some time, uh, you know that many people are very dogmatic. They will tell you that, you know, you need three-year plans, you know, all code should be tested, you should never break an API, quarterly uh, releases is the best, you know, the people are very kind of uh, opinionated about this. But I would say that in, in our opinion on the, on the DSA2 side is that software methodology is more of a strategic choice. You should really think of it as a strategic choice. Um, and it definitely relates to the face of the platform and it has trade-offs. So the trade-off is always between like long-term planning versus being very responsive. It's hard to be both, right? It's hard to have a five-year plan and react very quickly when someone comes to you. Having very long release cycles versus having short iterations, there's benefits and, and, and uh, downsides with both. Testing and QA versus features, like how much time do you spend on features? How much time do you spend on, on testing? And also how much time, how much do you focus on stability versus focusing on rapid change? Those are trade-offs to be made. You can't really have both sides here. So that's why we should think about this from a strategic um, side. So I would say that for DHS2, we really have more or less three phases. We had the startup phase uh, from the very beginning until like 2013-ish, where we were kind of in startup mode. Some people say we still are, but I, that's... So in the beginning, we really like focused on building the right solution, right? We didn't really spend a lot of time on testing and QA. Uh, we really focused on building like the right solution. We, we focused on like rapid prototyping, generating knowledge about what people need and what people want. That was the key focus at the time. Um, <clears throat> and really like when you're starting out with something, and this go, I would say goes for any product, if you're building something else, it's really about understanding what the users need and want. That's the top priority when you're starting out. Don't spend a ton of time writing tests and pipelines and things, because if you have no users, it doesn't matter if your software doesn't have any bugs because nobody's going to use it. You're going to run out of money and your project is going to go away. So, so that's why you need to focus on building knowledge about what people want. And do you do that with prototyping? Next phase around 2013-ish, um, this is what we call the growth phase. So this is when we went slightly out of startup mode and now starting to kind of grow the, the software. And the idea now was really to make the platform useful for many, right? So this phase, you really would like to make it useful for many and scalable. It doesn't really matter if you have a beautiful system, if it's used by five people, like nobody's gonna care. It'd be the best system in the world. So now you need to focus on scale, like make it scalable, make it possible to run at the country level and make it possible to run even at the global level. So in this phase, it's really important that you still need to accept breaking changes. I remember that we had a lot of complaints. People came and said, you guys, you're terrible. Like you break the API, you're breaking our apps and integrations. And we said, <clears throat> sorry, but we actually had to make a data model change because we learned that it's the right thing to do. So instead of then saying, okay, everything's gonna be stable, you need to actually allow for some change and even upset some people. You just have to live with it. I know from, um, from experience, uh, it can be hard. Um, and then the last phase, which I think we're in now, which is what they call global adoption. This is now when people are starting to say, you know, that this is the biggest, most implemented system in the, in the world and all that then you can say that, okay, we reach global level now. And this is where you would like to slow down. You need to slow down, focus on stability, focus on testing. Uh, now you can't do radical changes anymore. You can't do crazy things. You need to slow down and slow, slowly start to focus on testing, uh, slower release cycles, more Q&A, more focus on pipelines and CI, stability testing, beta testing. And uh, I still thank uh, you know, the, the, the guy upstairs that we had Phil, join us around uh, 2018, 19. Phil is our Q&A manager, has really brought a lot of uh, rigor and, and, and 
testing and quality assurance to the team. So we're very happy for that. Okay, um, we can skip ahead a little bit. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the software strategy for, for DHS2. So with DHS2, we, really, we try to really have a deliberate strategy from the very beginning. And I would say that a foundational piece of the strategy really was to have a strong core developer team, right? So the good thing with having a strong core developer team is that you can really have an overall vision and holistic plan for the software. It allows you to build the product that you would like to build. You can have a holistic, cohesive plan. Uh, we know of other systems in this space that rely more on community contributions um, that you know people in different countries and teams and so on submit patches. We think that that is problematic because it then really leaves it up to the community to decide what's going to happen. And it's very hard when you sit in one country to understand what to do from a global perspective. We know that's very hard. It's very hard to have a global perspective when you sit in one particular country or organization. So, so we believe that having a strong core team is really critical for having a software that's cohesive and have a holistic vision behind it. At the same time, as you talked about many times, we would like to make it very configurable and generic. So by making the system configurable, generic, uh, and, and kind of uh, adaptable, we allow implementers to really configure it to the needs. There's no need to go back to the dev team to, to kind of ask for something all the time. Uh, you're not stuck, not being able to do what you want. By having a really flexible system, you allow the implementers, like the non-technical or semi-technical implementers, to basically adapt the system. Um, and of course, designing the software with extensibility in mind. That's been absolutely critical for us. So what that means is that you can now allow the system to be integrated with others. You can build scripts as Prosper talked about in the morning. You can have scripts, integrations, widgets, plugins, name it whatever you want, custom web apps um, to go the last mile, to kind of cover the last mile in the country. It's very hard to make a generic software that supports the whole world, right? you do have to allow local teams to customize, to go the last mile and make it really work in the context. And to do that, you always have to do some local work. So that's what we're trying to do um, deliberately in the whole architecture of the software. And of course, we have seen this week that even from Oslo, we're trying to really support a capable community of local developers. So having um, the combination of a strong core team with a very capable a uh, set of like local teams in countries is a very powerful combination. We've seen so much innovation, you know, Tanzania and South Africa and, and Ghana, I'm probably forgetting many now, uh, have shown us like really amazing stuff this week, local apps, innovations, you know, integrations and, and whatnot. So it's clear now that the, this approach is working. Like we can see so much good, good things coming out of the country. So I really, um, really, really impressed with all the stuff going on now in, in the countries. So, so how does this translate then to the architecture? So <clears throat> all this strategy, we're trying to inform the architecture, right? So this, what you're looking at here is really like a very high level um, overview of the, of the architecture of DHS2. A bit simplified, of course, but from a high level. So, so what you see in the, in the blue uh, part there is really the core platform. This is the backend core DHS2 platform. Uh, that's, you know, stores the data and, and, and you know, has all the business logic, et cetera. The white areas there, are what enables this extensibility and, and integration. So we have APIs, uh, we have the app platform, we have webhooks, we also have other things that are really the enablers of extensibility and local customization. So these are the things that allow you to kind of plug in and extend. Uh, of course, we also have core web apps. So there will be core applications like the, the data entry and the maintenance and the data visualizer and all these things that you know well. Uh, we do believe that it's very important to have a strong set of core web apps at the same time, allowing for local web apps to be built in the context. So then around this core architecture, we then see that we can have local apps and local integrations so that local teams in countries are able to build their own web applications, their own Android applications. The Android app has come a fantastic uh, <laughs> uh, long way now. You can see uh, thanks to Marta and Jose and the, and the team, really a fantastic job. It now has an SDK. You can build your own apps on top of the SDK. You can plug in new domains, uh, new modules, and, and, and whatnot these days. It's become very sophisticated. Um, and it really also enables people to build their own Android applications. Same with integrations. People can now build their own integrations. Uh, we've seen numerous examples this week of people integrating systems. Now it's happening everywhere. So 
people are using the APIs, the web hooks, and so on to integrate with, with other systems. And this is, we like to say, this is by design. <laughs> this is what we try to do from the beginning to build a core platform that's possible to extend and, and, and build out in the local communities. Okay, so a couple of other points on, on, on how we think about software. First of all, facilitate the entire data flow. Uh, what this means is that DCS2 allows you to capture data, uh, import data, manage the data, and also analyze and visualize the data all in one thing. One, some people call it a boom box, you know, it can do everything. Um, I think we also seen this week that uh, we now see more and more like data lakes, data warehouses, data integration systems being used, which is very cool to see. And it's happening now these days. But for many countries, at least going back some years, I think setting up this kind of data lake architecture with data pipelines and joining of data sets and that stuff, it's quite, quite complicated. It's not trivial, right? And many people struggle, even them all over the world, many, many people struggle with that. So allowing people to do the whole life cycle of data in one platform has really been helpful for us. Data entry, imports, validation, analytics in the same place. Now we see that it's becoming more of a kind of more broader architecture, but that's just very, very interesting to see. Open source license, of course, has been critical. Um, I have to be honest, we don't get a ton of contributions. It's not like it's coming in lots of patches and so on. Um, that's not really been the major benefit. I would say the main, the main benefit of open source is that it reduces uh, risk of project financing. We know that many projects are time bound, of course. So with DHS2, even if you're running low on, on funding for a while, uh, you can still keep the lights on, right? You can still keep the lights on because the software itself doesn't cost anything. Every, I mean, hosting costs, et cetera, but the software itself doesn't cost anything. So uh, it also then removes the procurement and licensing process. If you're going with the proprietary software, one, you have to pay for it, but B, you also have to have a process, right? You have to procure it. There's got to be contracting. Uh, you got to acquire licenses. You got to install licenses. It's just so much more inconvenient to do. With these two, you just download and install and you run. And that's really been helpful for us to make it simple to, to operate. Uh, scalability, of course, is important. We always try to think scalability first, right? Many systems um, tend to do like low-level individual data. They don't really, they don't, they work very well in a couple of districts, but they don't work so well in a country, right? So if you try to use a system that's developed for a few districts, uh, it typically doesn't work so well at the national scale. But so we try to make it work at the national scale and even at the global scale. So you can take the software, run it in, you know, Bangladesh, or you can run it, you know, PSI runs in six, 60 countries and so on. You're trying to think about scale before focusing on complex features. And finally, like hosting anywhere. So with DHS2, you have a wide range of options for hosting. So it's not like it's only in the cloud or only on-prem or desktop. You can choose. So DHS2 can be hosted on-premise in a local or government data center. It can be hosted in the cloud, in your own cloud account. And you can also sign up now for managed hosting in the cloud. There are multiple providers of manage uh, hosting of DHS2. So you can, if you just want to click a button, you can do that also. So this kind of breadth of hosting options also been critical. Okay, we're getting to the end. We're getting to the end. Um, so a couple of, just a couple of design principles that we have uh, behind the DHS2 software. There's a ton of software principles, obviously. So I'm going to just pick, pick some of my favorite uh, principles here. So the first one is that real user needs and input really are the foundation of product design, right? So listening to users is really the foundation for everything. I think we all agree. Like if you don't have users, if you don't listen to them, you're not really having a system. If you're sitting somewhere else in a meeting room trying to make up your requirements, it's not going to be very successful. So you need to have users. You need to listen to them. That's number one. When that said, um, I also want to say, since I have people's attention, that you should tell us your problem and not your solution. This is something we see a lot. So, <laughs> so people come to us and say, you know, like I would like, you know, custom forms in Android, right? But then as system engineers, we always try to think, but why do you need custom forms in Android, right? And then people start to say, oh yeah, because I'm, I would like to have these colors and I would like to have, uh, you know, fields in this order and I would like to have a table of things, right? And then it's like, okay, so that is your problem. Right? That is your problem. You would like to order the things differently. You'd like different colors. Let's work on that. And then we can go back and design a solution that allows you to do that in a different way that might be better, right? So when you give us feedback, we sincerely appreciate the feedback, but try to tell, you, tell us your problem and not your solution necessarily. 
And again, um, I just want to mention that sometimes it's quite hard to also be a core team because we get a lot of requests. You know, people come to us and ask for many things. Now that we have apps, it's become better because people can build things themselves. Uh, but from our perspective also, we have to be a little bit careful that if you try to please everyone, uh, you're not gonna really going to please anyone. Uh, said differently, if you say yes to every request, the, the, I, I think the reality is that nobody's actually going to use your platform 10 years from now. Uh, we try to keep the software a little bit simple. Like we try to not overwhelm it with a million features because if we add a million features, it's going to be too complex. And one day you're going to say, this is too complex for me. I give up. So when you talk to us and we say, man, maybe not, that is typically why we say, because in the long run, it's very good to keep the software simple. Which is the last point, start simple. We always try to start simple. So when you build new features, when we build new features, we always try to keep, to keep things simple. Like in the first iteration, we don't add too many things. If you add too many features, if you make it too complex, the chance is that you're making too many assumptions. Uh, you're trying to starting to guess what people need. And when you make guesses, very often you, you get it wrong, right? And the risk goes up because now when you're building things that people don't really need, you have to go back and change it and people get unhappy. So that's why we try to, to keep it simple. All right, and that's it. Um, thanks for, for listening. I think um, we're gonna move it over to, um, to Austin now. I just wanna say uh, Austin has taken over the um, lead developer role now uh, uh, recently. He's been doing a really tremendous job. Um, he's doing you know hiring and recruiting and proposals and software and team management and whatnot. It's been really good. I think you should give Austin a good round of applause. Don't leave yet. Thank you, Lars, but don't leave yet because I have the, the great misfortune, not only of following Lars on the stage here, but also as the technical lead of the project. So whoever is willing, please stand up and give Lars a huge round of applause for the last 17 years with DHS too. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Don't worry, he's not leaving yet either. <laughs> We're kicking him in around as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And it's not like he's left, you know? Yeah. So, you know, he just... still continue <laughs> in the capacity of advisor, <laughs> and he will continue to advise us in a 20%, okay? Yeah. Lars is uh, uh, handing the reins a little bit as the, the lead uh, developer, technical lead over to me, which uh, is is a challenge <laughs> that I am uh, trying to do my best to step into, but I'm very appreciative of um, him also being uh, on as an advisor as we continue. So coming from three people in Kerala, in the India, um, building DHIS2, this is a screenshot from the DHIS2 website. Um, great new map that was put together by Bjorn and Max's team and communications showing all the different use cases and all the different countries where DHIS2 is used. There's more than 100, probably this isn't even a complete list. I think there are several that are uh, not yet in that database. Um, because it is free and open source software, people are using it all over the world in ways that we don't understand. We don't know. <laughs> we, can't, <laughs> we can't know because it's uh, somebody downloads it and uses it as the national system in their country and tells us three years later when something breaks. But if you don't see yourself on the map, you can send us an email and we'll add you. <laughs> if you don't see yourself on the map, uh, go, go to the website, go to the in action section, and you can look at the different uh, categories um, share your stories also with Max. There are good, great impact stories from a lot of different countries on there. Um, but we now also have a, a much bigger team. So in, from three people uh, in, uh, in the room, kind of writing code at night and pushing to production in the morning, um, or sending it on a, a, a CD uh, <laughs> on a motorbike around the, around the country. Uh, we now have more than uh, or around 60 people on the core software team uh, spread all over the world. Um, it's a remote first team. So a lot of them are um, watching online here today. Um, and that's, that's been a big change. And it also helps us to, to push things forward while also 
building in the stability and the, um, uh, the, the foundation that DHS2 uh, provides for all of these different countries. And one of the ways that we address kind of the trade-offs that Lars put in his slides, um, where he mentioned that you, you have to choose between either slowing down releases or moving quickly and, and innovating quickly. You have to choose between uh, stability and agility. And that's, that is true, but we're, we're kind of cheating by building this platform for extensibility. So the core and the foundation is moving into that, um, that global adoption phase where it's the foundation for so much that all of you are working on around the world. And that needs to be stable. That needs to be rock solid. And we need to do a lot to make sure that that is, uh, has all of the, the core uh, functionality for use usable software, a usable platform, that it has no bugs, that it has uh, performs well as scales uh, go to huge, huge numbers in many different countries. But it can also be the foundation, uh, the platform for innovation. And that innovation is something that we do by developing different applications, but mostly it's what all of you do. And there were a large number of very high quality applications that were submitted to the app competition this year. It was a very difficult choice to choose the finalists that you'll see later today. And so we want to enable that type of innovation, not only locally, but also to share those innovations and use them across different countries. So we able, we're able to kind of cheat by building a platform that is stable, but also provides the, the foundation for agile development and iteration. So how are we going to do that going forward? I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what's coming next for DHS2 as a platform. Um, extensions is something that is the, the next step beyond applications. So we have web applications and Android apps. We have the app platform. We have the Android SDK. But very infrequently, I think, is an app, a web application enough, right? If you have that hammer, everything looks like a nail. You start to build integrations and you start to build data processing in web applications, which is not the right place for those to be. So it's really to enable the full spectrum of customization and adaptation of DHS2 to different contexts, we need to build the, the kind of the, the primitives, enable those primitives to be used in those extensions and to be built. So that includes extending the API, extending the data model, um, having custom configuration that is shared between different countries and contexts, having applications, having plugins that let you put extensions in certain places in DHS2 and not having to reinvent the wheel and build an entirely new application. And especially integrations also with other systems as there's more and more heterogeneous and, and complex architectures in health and other domains as well. So this is where we're going. There's a lot of ways that we can uh, support this and we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, one of those is pl plugins. So we, for a long time, have had the ability to build plugins on the dashboard. We're expanding that capability, making it more secure, more performant, um, allowing you to bundle a plugin with an application that's already available in, in version 239 and 40. Um, but there are other places where we want to enable extension points in DHS to enable people to extend uh, just the part that they need to, to customize for their particular use case or their particular context. So that includes on the tracked entity dashboard and the capture app uh, in data entry with what has been custom forms, being able to enable customization and adaptation of those forms and interfaces for a specific context. It includes Android application modules. So you can plug in, uh, as we saw with the real-time stock module that was demonstrated in uh, version 40, you can have modular modularization of the Android application and be able to replace the, the specific parts that you need for a particular program while still keeping the rest of the great application that's there. And many, many other uh, examples as well. Potentially custom map layers will we'll look at where, where we can add additional extensions. Another way that we're uh, looking at approaching this is by moving to uh, what we call a global app shell. So in the um, 
development of the application platform, we introduced the concept of an application shell. That's where the, the header bar became much more consistent across the platform than it was before. Uh, <laughs> at one point, there was no header bar on many applications. In some cases, that's still the case. Um, and what we're moving towards is being able to make that consistent across all of the different uh, applications within a particular instance uh, by furthering that separation and, and allowing the, the app shell to be updated independently and to be global across your entire instance. Um, so this is another one way that we're addressing this as well. And this also helps to provide a consistent user experience and a usable uh, experience for the users of DHIS2 in different contexts. Another way is by introducing tracker plugins. So I mentioned this for tracked entity uh, instance dashboard in, in Capture App. There are many other places where we might wanna include uh, extensions or plugins in DHIS2. Uh, and this one is plugins in the Capture App for data entry. So being able to customize how you actually enter an ICD-10 code or an ICD-11 code uh, or other uh, potential ways that you want to customize the experience so that someone can uh, have a, a, a basically perform their job in a better way. So this might look like uh, having a button instead of a, 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 just a drop down with an option set uh, that then opens up a very complex custom interface for doing ICD-11 coding, for example. But there are many, many, many more examples of where this can be very valuable. Um, so this is something that we want to add as, a, as an extension point in DHS2 is to be able to customize how you do data entry for specific data elements in a custom form for, or in, in a form, for example. I mentioned also Android application modules. So um, thank you very much, Marcos, who's here for uh, providing this slide for me. Um, but there are currently there are a lot of modules within the Android application. And some of those you might want to customize for particular programs. Maybe your stock management tool, which is like RTS, the real-time stock tool, that is a little bit of a different program than a, tr a typical tracker or event program might be. And so being able to customize the look and feel and the, the um, uh, user experience just for that one program while keeping everything else that is built into that application uh, is really powerful. We have other, other examples um, from uh, log, uh, logistics and education, but there are many more that enable this to be uh, useful for individual country implementations as well. And then we get to the server side. So as we mentioned, uh, a web application hammer is not necessarily the hammer that you want to use for a lot of these solutions. Uh, and so we're looking at how we can uh, expand the, um, the platform of DHS2 to make it easier to build uh, and share extensions that also occur on the server side, as Lars mentioned, the microservice server extensions. So this is enabling uh, us also to be more agile and more modular and granular in the releases that we have, in the components that we provide, uh, but also allows for custom integrations and custom backend services to be built and shared within the community. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how we're, at, we're actually going to do this um, or what the next releases are. Uh, this is the, the, the main bad news for the, for the um, presentation. Um, there is good news that comes right after it, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, version 41, so first of all, uh, before, before I dive into that, uh, we're talking about versions here in whole numbers. So version 40 and version 41, um, we're moving away from the concept of having 2.40 and 2.41 because that gets a little bit redundant and gives us a little bit less flexibility. So there was actually an announcement that was published today and, and basically sharing that HISP and DHIS2 are just names. And they are names because we're moving into new domains outside of health and we have functionality that's outside of just district level. There's national level, there's facility level, there's district level, there's international level. So they're just names, just like IBM and others have, have moved from international business machines to just being IBM. There are many other examples of this. Uh, and as part of that, DHS2 being part of the name, DHS2 2.40 doesn't really make sense. So we're moving to uh, version 40 and version 41, just a small semantic uh, <laughs> uh, Thing that we're doing. Um, but in order to focus on a few key things, namely quality, 
design and extensibility and really make sure that the core is stable and uh, a solid foundation for innovation and for use in countries. The next version, version 41, will be out in one year, so in, ver in May of 2024. But that doesn't mean we're going to be doing nothing between now and May of 2024. So these are the patch releases approximately that you will see for version 40, which was out last month in the next year. So we release a patch release uh, or a, a minor release approximately every two to three months for each of the supported versions. So this is version 40 patches. And these are the other patches that will approximately, obviously the, the, the exact dates and the exact numbers will might change. But these are, this is what we're working on in the meantime, right? So we're, we have supported versions for 38 and 39 and 40 that will be continually improved and uh, worked on during the next year as we're also developing version 41. And that's not all because we have continuous release, which I talked about um, on Monday as well. And this is where applications can be released independently of the core. So even though version 41 won't necessarily be out for another year, we can continually improve and build even features and uh, functionality into the applications that are uh, built on top of that platform. So that's things like the maintenance application, the uh, data visualizer application, dashboards, every single web app that you can see in DHIS2 can be continually improved uh, over the course of this year, including adding some functionality. So there might be uh, releases of these applications throughout the year. It might be every week. If there's a, 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 an issue that needs to be handled quickly, we can release it very quickly. It can be updated in different instances in a very uh, timely manner. And if there's an issue, it can also be rolled back in those instances. So we'll be uh, releasing continuously the applications and the extensions to DHIS2, which are becoming more and more powerful over the course of this year, which allows us to have both the stability of the long release cycle with the agility of short releases for individual applications or extensions. And if this sound feels overwhelming, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of releases there. Uh, we'll be also including these applications in, in the core releases. So you don't need to take them if, if you don't need those features or that functionality. You can wait for the one that's bundled with the next major release. You can also, uh, we'll be trying to bundle up kind of an announcement of what, what has been released in the last three months, once a quarter, so that you can know these are the applications that were released, these are the minor versions that were released, and this is the major version that came out this quarter, for example. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about version 41 specifically. Um, who here has watched the films or read the book, uh, Lord of the Rings? The Hobbit, J.R.R. Tolkien? Okay, there, there are quite a few for those of you online who can't see the audience. Um, who do you think is the hero of that film? <laughs> there was an answer, Gollum in the crowd. Um, for me, the Eagles, that's a good one. Um, so there are two main hobbits in the film, and one of them is Frodo, who everybody knows, and the other one is Samwise. And Samwise is the one who, who uh, slight spoiler, not too much, carries Frodo across the finish line, more or less. He's the one that is stable and gets, gets the Frodo to where he's going, which is to destroy the ring that is, yeah, anyway. <laughs> well, we won't go into that too much. This is, this is the code name for our version 41 release. And why is that? That is because we want to be the, the stable hero that is the foundation for everything that we're doing. This means that we're gonna focus on three things, quality, design, and extensibility infrastructure for the version 41 release of DHS2. And what does this actually mean? Uh, so I'm gonna share here a picture of my colleague, Anna, who was, this picture was taken in Jamaica. Um, it's gonna be a, a, a year of focusing on these things, which means there might be a, a few fewer features. I'll talk about a lot of the features that are exciting and coming up as well. But we're going to focus on quality design and extensibility so that we can provide this solid foundation. This means we'll work on stability and performance. We want to make upgrades as seamless and risk-free as possible, and we want to limit regressions that we introduce in version 41. We want to focus on design as well. So there are things in DHIS2 that are complicated sometimes. 
And sometimes it's training is a big challenge for a lot of implementations. And we can work to reduce the, the cost and the need for those trainings and the complexity of the software by focusing on usability, um, the quality of life of a user of DHIS2 so they can find what they're looking for and have an intuitive way to navigate around the platform, consistency across different applications, and things like accessibility that have not been highly prioritized in the past. And then extensibility, which, as I mentioned, is allowing the rapid iteration and the rapid adaptation of DHIS2 to local contexts. Uh, that means we need to focus on building a, a rock solid platform for that extensibility that extends beyond just applications. But it wouldn't be a what's next for DHIS2 presentation if I didn't talk about some of the features of DHIS2 that are coming in 41, uh, in the 41 timeframe. So we have a lot of releases in applications as well that might be a little bit before, a little bit after. But in this time frame, we're gonna be working on a number of things uh, that are exciting. And some of these are part of the usability push. So some of these are focusing on making DHS2 more usable, more accessible, more easy to understand. Um, but some of them are, are functionality that is highly requested and that we, we've known we needed to implement for some time as well. So the first of these is a new version of the login application. So the login app is a little bit, uh, a little bit dated. I think I saw a presentation uh, for PEPFAR maybe in one of Lars's slides where it's had this exact same login page, probably from 2014. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same, but um, <laughs> maybe it was 2016, 2017. But uh, it's been around for quite a while uh, and needs a little bit of, of uh, TLC. This doesn't look that different, does it? That's okay because this means that we can uh, build on the, the core that we all know, the core login application and extend it. So have a, a, an updated refreshed design while still keeping it familiar. But importantly, this also allows for customization in a way that hasn't been supported in the past. So this login page could also be supported out of the box for DHIS2. It's a customization using themes to be able to say, I want to put my login dialogue on the left side. I want to put an image uh, on the right side. Maybe I want to have some logos there for different uh, supporters of this, this uh, particular implementation. And this will be a, a, a theme that we can provide potentially out of the box. We're moving to a, a new technology that is part of also the um, extensibility infrastructure effort to eliminate some of the older technologies that are underlying DHS2. So we needed to redo the login application anyway. And there are a lot of ways that people customize it today that aren't typically supported out of the box. They're, they're very custom uh, kind of hacky ways to do it. So we're trying to make that more of a first class feature. That includes having login uh, uh, support, like uh, it, theming of the login page support, like you see here. It includes a, a improved way to do two-factor authentication. So you don't have to check a box and then put in a code. If you don't really know what that is, that's very confusing. So if you have two-factor authentication enabled, you will log in as normal, and then you'll get, just like you see in most other applications, then you'll get a um, dialogue asking you to enter the code from your authenticator application. And then we have the ability to do fully custom DHS2 login application themes. So this means you can put custom images, custom uh, links, you can do whatever you want with this um, while keeping the, the login functionality that is built into the application and can be basically injected and then themed in a fully custom way. So now for the next uh, functionality that probably a lot of people have been waiting a long time for. This is around maintenance and particularly the maintenance application. We're gonna make it better. That's the, <laughs> that's the bottom line. <laughs> so I should, I should preface all of this by saying that we're, we're engaging in a, an iterative development and design process where some of these, uh, some of these mockups might change. And that's actually a very good thing because it means we're talking to users, as Lars said. We're talking to people and seeing 
all right, this is the idea that we have. Let's make sure that this actually makes sense for the 100 countries that are using DHIS2. Bulk edits in maintenance. That's something that has been asked for for a long time. So this is a, a new way to uh, view and edit and manage your metadata or your configuration in DHIS2 in a way that's been very difficult in the past. Um, and so building in a lot of this functionality to do uh, bulk edits, to do um, uh, more intuitive and streamlined ways to edit individual objects, um, pagination, standardized look and feel, and being able to filter, all of these types of things um, are part of this redesign. This is just an example of one of the, the data entry forms, but it'll also be much improved compared to the, um, uh, the look and feel that's been a, a little bit dated for DHS2 maintenance app. And then we have organization unit management, another functionality within the maintenance app that has been long requested. So this includes things like being able to merge organization units, is things like bulk editing and management of organization unit trees uh, in, within the maintenance application. So there's a lot that's going on there. Um, and I did wanna mention one thing that is in addition to this, that this is part of a, a larger effort to make it easier and more powerful ways to manage and maintain the metadata of DHS2 systems and particularly a network of DHS2 systems over time. So in addition to this, we're talking about import export stability and, and improvements there and talking about ways to extend the data model to make it easier to manage uh, permissions and bulk um, groups of metadata within DHS2. So now I'm gonna go through some more features uh, quickly. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna go quickly through them. Um, one of those is cross-program line lists. So we introduced the line listing application recently, but that is only listing events and enrollments. Um, we now will have the ability to introduce uh, tracked entity line lists or um, cross-program line lists to be able to uh, analyze and uh, cohorts of people that are across different programs. We also have some functionality in dashboards that has been very much requested. Um, again, these are early mockups, but that includes being able to manage dashboards in a way that hasn't been possible before. Being able to manage these uh, dashboards in a, um, a dedicated interface, which cleans up and makes it easier to, to have the data be front and center in the dashboards themselves. So hiding a lot of the, the management interface that you might've seen uh, in the past and, and really getting it out of the way of the data that you want to present to the user. This includes things like filtering and uh, moving those into places where you have more room to really uh, expand on the functionality that's, ba that's based there and more features like that. A couple more that I wanted to talk about. I only have a few minutes left, but uh, referrals and transfers in the capture application. This is something we've referred to as temporary referrals and permanent referrals in the past. Um, but this allows you to not only make a referral out, but also to respond to that referral and say that some uh, person was potentially um, seen or a referral was processed by the um, uh, receiving organization unit or the receiving facility. Android capture usability, we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the week as well. This is improvements that are ongoing and is a part of our push for usability, making it easier to understand what's going on and to see the data that you need and to really get through the application in a, in a consistent and intuitive way. So there's a lot of improvements coming there for usability. And then this one is, uh, it's a small one, but it's one of my favorites. Um, this has been there for quite a while uh, in the, the maintenance app subsections being available in the application menu, but it has slowly faded out of, uh, <laughs> out of the um, uh, interface. And now we're bringing it back and we're making it even better. So in addition to being able to jump to data elements overview in this example, or to create, go to the create a new data element um, uh, screen immediately from anywhere in DHIS2, we're looking at being able to also jump directly to visualizations that you know exist in your system, to be able to search for malaria and find things related to malaria in different applications in DHIS2 without needing to know that you need to go to the data visualizer application and then file open and search in there. So this will help uh, users to find their way around the system. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with an interface like this in combination with the global app shell, which allows us to have this 
immediately available in all the different applications across DHIS2, so you have a consistent interface no matter where you are. And then my last slide is there's a lot of things under the hood that we want to work on in 41, and this is around the, um, the focus on extensibility infrastructure, on quality, and that includes a big focus on performance and a focus on security and a focus on quality. So we have uh, testing efforts that have been uh, overhauled in 40, version 40 with the beta testing program. We have performance testing that we want to do, and we want to make sure that we are uh, improving uh, the functionality of things like program indicators and analytics runtime and having a robust um, functionality for importing and exporting metadata to be able to manage metadata in a system. So look for a lot more that might not be flashy screenshots, but hopefully will be even more useful and um, uh, make DHIS2 a really useful platform in all of the countries where you're working. And with that, thank you for listening and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Austin. I, I guess there's so many that want to, to, to post questions for Lars and Austin, but we are actually doing the panel again. And then there will be question possibilities for you. Uh, please, Austin and Lars, uh, sit. Please sit. And then I will call upon Mark to see you from PEPFAR. We heard the PEPFAR story a bit today. And then I will also call up Pamut from his Sri Lanka, Andrew from Ministry of Health in Rwanda and his Rwanda, and then Jörn, where are Jörn? Jörn also, but then you need to bring your rucksack down. You know. Cannot bring that for the panel. No one will steal your computer while you're sitting there. We will take care of it. Tommy Carr will take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted to, to, to continue to be, be a bit energetic here this morning. We need one more chair. <laughs> Welcome to Mark, he just arrived. You will be able to squeeze because we are, we have uh, the last, I would say, semester discussed heavily how we can improve the uh, innovation capabilities, creating even a more innovative uh, innovation ecosystem around the DHS2. And that is actually um, uh, been, of course, inspired by the we would say, uh, proof of the concept of the HS2 as an innovative pro um, platform during the pandemic, where we saw that um, Sri Lanka was the first, uh, even uh, in January uh, 2020, late January 2020, three days after the three, two suspected cases coming into the, the port of Colombo, uh, Colombo in Sri Lanka, they were able to make a port of entry. I just have to tell, it took uh, the municipality of Norway or Oslo or Norway one and a half year to do a port of entry for Gardermoen. Took three days in Sri Lanka. So I just want to, 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 to let uh, Pamud brag a bit about how that was possible on the on the platform of the DHS2 without, you know, having all the programming expertise. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Christine, for briefly introducing like what exactly happened in uh, Sri Lanka back in uh, back around like uh, January 2020. So in summary, like what was made possible was one thing. Like uh, so, within a couple of weeks uh, of like everyone got to know like there is something really strange going on, um, starting from China, but like spreading really fast. We were able to produce something uh, for COVID-19 surveillance in Sri Lanka, which is again, like we as in not just a, his, his Sri Lanka, it was uh, us and especially the Ministry of Health and many others, like it, especially the ICT agency, uh, who's representing all the tech related work and the entire governance of the country. So uh, that is one. And the next thing I wanted to highlight is Around this, I mean, like just after like one year's time, uh, then we started producing COVID-19 vaccine. And that is when uh, we were also tasked with this very difficult um, uh, target of uh, enrolling the entire population of 21 million people of Sri Lanka into DHS2 and to track them uh, for COVID-19 vaccination. So these were the two things that, that uh, are the highlights of this entire implementation. But but I would like to highlight is about uh, what made it possible. So this is some something that is also relating 
to uh, my PhD work. So first thing, uh, of course, like I will start with what uh, Austin has la and last has been highlighting the platform. So yesterday evening, there was one session at 5 p.m. where we kind of tried to discuss about uh, the digital public goods and the community. And like uh, one aspect was like now DHIS2 is present everywhere, right? Not just health, education, climate. Who is doing that? Are you guys promoting DHIS2 uh, by just going to all the ministries? It's not really that. The, the true thing that actually happened in, in Sri Lanka and many other countries is like platform. Uh, while it is being modular, it's so customizable, right? Uh, we have many other DPGs or so open source solutions where the community and I mean, like it's actually mostly talking to the developers, but here it's the implementers and the ministries. It is so easy to uh, adopt. So that is one main thing about the platform that made it possible during the pandemic. So it was not just an agile development, uh, it was agile implementation. So we started with something very basic for port of entry monitoring. And then, of course, we had a lot of support. That's my second thing, the community and the engagement. So we had a local community in Sri Lanka, plus UIO and the entire HISP. Like we were working with everyone in the HISP and the UIO. Austin, uh, specifically, I must mention, like uh, he had sleepless nights supporting us to build apps based on this innovative platform. And of course, finally, the local capacity. So we had a lot of collaborations with the University of Colombo, like more than uh, one decade, I would say, like Prof. Yon can talk more about it. <laughs> so we had in-country capacity. So that's why we were competent uh, and confident to do something during the pandemic. So these things, three things are what made it possible. Super. And then we can go over to, to Andrew, maybe, because they may be the the, the best in class of borrowing all these innovations across uh, the his groups. Can you tell a bit about your experiences? Yeah, uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, I think um, Rwanda is like Sri Lanka. So for us, uh, what happened is that, uh, you know, my personal experience is that during the pandemic, you'll, people always panic and the panicking goes around this, uh, the different areas. I remember when they called me to go to the front line, I was at home. Then my family was telling me, you're going? I said, yes, I'm going. Oh, you're going to bring COVID in the, back home? I said, no, 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 it's not bring COVID. We're going to do interventions, A, B, C, D. They said, let's pray for you. Then close your eyes. When I, that time you see God when you close your eyes. But what I want to mean is that uh, sometimes during the pandemic, there will always be no options. I mean, no one would be knowing what to do, what will happen. Then, lucky enough, when we had a story from Sri Lanka, that's when we understood that the, at least there is a module, there is a package that can be implemented. So one story I want to tell you, when we are trying to find different solutions, because during COVID, there was many suggestions. One vendor came and said, we can customize it. Then let's have a meeting tomorrow. Then all of us, we went, including our leadership, to check on the system. Then when you reached on the timeline, the person said, it will take us six months. That is the minimum. Then the minister was like, oh, six months, all of us maybe will be, will be not there. <laughs> then that option was not, was not our option. Because you know that's why I want just to emphasize on the flexibility of DHS2. So, Imagine if you can implement a solution and it takes six months uh, when, you are, when it's an intervention for the outbreak. So what we did was, uh, because after reading the, the, the story from Sri Lanka, we told our leadership, give us time because you know when we are taking this innovation, we don't say we are taking them. We just say we are going to, to code. Then they give us like two days, we go somewhere. When it's just import, importing the package, then we went and imported the package, one day, second day, third day, we started the system running and everyone was reporting. We were able to, to, to get the data because it was important for us to know the cases, to confirm the cases and be able to know what, which intervention. Because remember on the pandemic, you have to ensure that uh, one district, if it's more affected, it doesn't affect another district. So for me, I think the important thing that made Rwanda to, to use the HS2 during pandemic one is flexibility. It takes little time to implement because at least we have a big community that are implementing and they're having innovations. And these innovations are free. They are open. That is our value. 
The second is that we have a global team, the network. We are not working alone. We are in countries, but we work with the country experts. But again, we have global teams that are developing the system that gives us the confidence to implement. The third is that we don't require training. Sometimes some of these modules, they are using tracker and we already have tracker there. Then whenever you implement it, users will get used without having the five or 10 days training. So without taking long, I think we'll be answering based on the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. And uh, this is very good examples, but uh, as we learned from Lars, but some of us knew it before and everyone knows it actually, our history with PEPFAR goes way back from when Mike Garen came 8th of December, 2012. And we, okay, we can go into 13 then. But uh, Mark, can you tell a bit about the, 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 the travel and the journey with DHS2 and why PEPFAR chose to, to go along? And we are very happy for that, I have to say. That's another story, how PEPFAR has been so instrumental to for DHS2 to, to become a platform because somebody needs to finance the core and nobody wants that except our platform. <laughs> Oops. So what Thank is you, yours? <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly in this panel with so many esteemed uh, colleagues. Uh, you know, PEPFAR has been investing in the DHIS2 platform, as you said, since 2012, actually. I think some of those initial discussions started. And this predates uh, the shift in the PEPFAR program to, to doing much more granular data collection, much more frequently. Um, at the facility level. And, and we support over 50,000 um, individual facilities, over 53 countries, so uh, more, than, more than 30. Um, and in 23 of those countries, those are bilateral. So we have a bilateral agreement in those, um, in almost all those countries, um, DHIS2 investments predated PEPFAR's engagement in, in those countries. Um, and, and that was one of the major reasons why my, my predecessor, Mike Garon, um, chose as, as we were looking at sort of reading the tea leaves about where the program was going, wanting to do more than sort of a single data point entered for um, a single country once or twice per year to quarterly getting much more granular about all aspects of uh, the HIV epidemic monitoring that. And so um, that, that appetite for data, um, we knew on the system side that you were not going to be able to engage with host governments around um, that level of data collection, that level of frequency, if you were to bring in some big proprietary system that really had the perception of hoovering up data from, from a country. So um, that was a strategic decision to use the systems that were known and trusted and that there was a large community built around DHIS2 already. However, <laughs> there were growing pains associated with that. And, and Lars uh, mentioned, and I see Jason and Ula and lots of other folks um, who've been part of that journey with the PEPFAR program over the last decade plus. Um, PEPFAR is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Um, there's a big campaign, of course, with our lawmakers to advocate for a reauthorization of the program. And, and we're very hopeful about that. Um, but something really remarkable is happening right now within the Department of State where, where I work and where the PEPFAR program um, is, is focused. And so we are, as in about two weeks, we will be the Global Health Security and Diplomacy Bureau. Um, PEPFAR has always been sort of a temporary office within the Department of State. And the PEPFAR program will be the anchor for this bureau. Um, so we will still be executing PEPFAR, we'll still be doing that, but there will be other diseases added to that bureau. And our ambassador, uh, Ambassador John Kingasong, who previously led Africa CDC and worked on the COVID response across the continent, um, will be dual-hatted representing that bureau and the, the PEPFAR office. I mention this because it's relevant, um, because as the, as the PEPFAR program has helped to advocate for more investments in DHIS2, created that appetite for data much more frequently, much more granularly, which again, we can get into some of the caveats associated with that. Um, we have an opportunity to better coordinate the way in which different parts of the United States government are thinking about their data models, the tools they use to take those up, the, the capacity approaches they take for those that are collecting and managing um, data systems at a country level. And so we see potential over the next years to really leverage the, the new organization 
within our office and our bureau to be sharing the examples and the experiences that we have within HIV data um, across a, a variety of other areas. Now, the, the, the double-sided coin with uh, PEPFAR using data so often is that there's just this insatiable appetite for the types of data at a global level that we, that we need. Um, and so we're really trying to, there's, there's, there's a, a sustainability roadmap in, in development right now, and we have a data roadmap that will be a part of that, that'll be publicly available um, in the next few months as well. And we really wanna start in incentivizing, my, my boss uh, disagreed uh, just last week, and I was trying to say, we need to control our appetite for data, and that's not going to happen. Where we do agree is, <laughs> We can control our appetite for parallel data. So we really need to be doing more education showing the consequences of asking for things that don't really exist in national systems and being <laughs> and using a better awareness of what actually exists and what it takes to generate those to inform what we collect, when and how we use that. And so part of that data roadmap is better describing the, the sort of archetypes, the states of, 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 of national systems and investments from country to country and helping us to understand what we can reasonably ask for and in what formats. Um, and I'm looking at my colleagues from Global Fund who are in here as well, who are um, already starting to think about following PEPFAR's model for direct reporting and really just want to encourage us and our colleagues from WHO as well, really just to be thinking really very hard about how and, and, and what we're requesting because of because of those consequences. Um, I, I did just want to say a, a couple other things. Um, as we're as we're de developing and using these systems, the, the need to monitor the HIV uh, epidemic epidemic uh, longitudinally is is very real. And most many countries are doing some sort of individual level um, systems, whether that's tracker or, or open MRS or something else. Um, and, and also for HIV and many other programs, we need to look beyond data that may be in DHIS too. And so there's a lot of guidance that we have out of, around our program right now around sort of integrated national data repositories, data warehouses. Um, in some countries, they may be trying to use DHIS too for that. Lars and I spoke earlier. But in a lot of, they're, they're using Azure, they're using AWS, they're using something um, that may be on-prem that might be hosted, might be hybrid. And we should only expect more of that. Um, and we're driving a demand for that. But thinking about how DHIS2 feeds into that, is part of that, is absolutely important. Um, coming from um, uh, representing the United States government, we have a lot of cybersecurity requirements. And so a lot of these investments in core have been a necessity for things that we need to be able to use this platform um, within the United States government system boundary. Um, and those are only increasing. So multi-factor authentication, um, encryption of data at rest, encryption of data in transit, zero trust architecture is a big one that's coming as well. And so we were able to grandfather use of DHIS2 in um, as an open source product. And it's not as encouraged right now with the US government. So we really wanna be working more closely with the University of Oslo um, over the next years to really continue to advocate for why investments in open source systems are so important and demonstrating how those can actually work with the um, United States government boundary, other boundaries where there's an increasing focus on cybersecurity, um, et cetera. And that gets me to the point that Kristen raised as well. So, we continue to hear about how great it is to have free features in the platform um, and the importance for standard core, but that doesn't come for free. There, there is someone paying for those salaries and others. And so um, PEPFAR was, has been very fortunate in the ability for our funding to be able to be not implementation focused um, for the, the funds that we give to, to core software development. We do have a much larger amount of funds that we put into implementation, but that happens at our country level. So our, we have a core investment that goes there. We were able, I think NORAD and PEPFAR were some of the original partners that were able to provide that, that core funding. And for all the reasons that, that Austin and Lars have laid out this morning, we feel that this is absolutely important. And looking at my colleagues from Digital Square Path, where we coordinate um, our investments to to uh, to University of Oslo for core software. We're looking to donors to be able to make that case um, more broadly. Um, it, there's huge benefits to having a stable uh, platform that we can use in a lot of different sectors, a lot of use cases. 
but uh, in the early days, we were very nervous where PEPFAR was an outsized piece of that pie for the core software development. Those pieces have increased. The overall size of the pie has increased, and that's great, but we need to continue to advocate for, what, for, why, um, for, for why that's important. Um, and then just uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave with um, the importance of, of working with indigenous capacity. The, the PEPFAR program has a target of 70% of our funds that go to the country level are focused on indigenous organizations. I, I think there's so many with the HIST networks, with others that are using DHIS2, there's a, just a huge community of, of developers that are doing this, but more, more broadly, even beyond DHIS2, huhuge initiatives around data science. I know Rwanda just hosted an event in, the, in, in this this year as well. Um, and we're really looking at uh, more, more, more data literacy, um, making sure that we're able to support platforms that are that are using data in all sorts of different formats, not just from DHIS2. Um, and, and, and those are not sorts of things that you need to bring in outside, um, outside organizations to be um, really meeting a lot of those, those, those sorts of needs. So um, very excited that we're able to continue supporting the DHIS2 platform. Thank you. Thank you. I think it needs a hand for this one. Thank you for that pledge. <laughs> and you and uh, maybe you would like to talk about something else, but however, <laughs> or you want to talk about it's little no question. Paper, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, one thing I wanted to, to uh, raise uh, because I noted that in us, uh, one of his slides where that open source is good because it's less bureaucracy. And what I will emphasize is rather that it's good uh, even, even, uh, even uh, research-based evidence that open source is enabling innovation as it is uh, evidence that proprietary software is hindering innovation. And that was the example from, from uh, Andrew and, and, uh, and Pamud on what happened uh, during, uh, during the pandemic uh, where the network of open source uh, software actually enabled the uh, sharing of uh, best practices and even apps and not necessarily only the apps, but also the 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 way to do things, the best practices, etc. So I think that is a very very uh, important part of everything, and it's also. I mean, I can. I mean, uh, after uh, you, I have to mention something about uh, PEPFAR as well. And uh, we started to discuss with uh, your predecessor, uh, Mark Gairn, uh, many years back, and at one point I remember I asked him. Uh, why is the uh, uh, US government uh, coming here and supporting an uh, open source uh, kind of anarchistic uh, group like this? That's not very <laughs> normal. <laughs> and he said, yes, no, because uh, we are uh, progressive, uh, he said, and also because the reason, the official reason was that DHS is used in all these countries and eventually we want to have interoperability and collaboration and uh, leaning on capacity, et cetera, et cetera, with these countries. So that was, uh, according to him, then the, the official uh, reason that, but he, he, I think it's uh, quite uh, interesting that, uh, that this uh, collaboration came about and I'm happy to hear that it will continue into the future. <laughs> we cross our fingers for that. And, into this this uh, talk about PEPFAR and uh, Mark Aaron, I want to say something about the future of, of DHIS because he also had one other in our, our numerous discussions. He also said, ah, I don't understand why you guys are not focusing on where you have monopoly, absolute monopoly, and that's aggregate data and that kind of analysis. And I, when, when we now think about uh, the future of, of uh, DHS2, I want to raise that again, not only the aggregate data, but please remember that everything that has to do with analytics, m and &E, et cetera, whether it's come, I mean, on the run from, from the tracker or from medical records, et cetera, it's always about 
single units of, of, of uh, numerical data. And the analytics coming from that tradition is what we have now seen is a big problem for, for uh, DHIS too, because we have been so successful in making it possible to specialize uh, into different uh, systems, which is a good thing, uh, because that uh, enable participation and user user control of the development. But at the same time, it creates a problem with the uh, integration and different silos of systems, etc. So that has brought us back to where it started and that we need to work harder on the analytics and we have already had a lot of say competition from the systems and all these other kind of Tableau and, and others who are actually doing exactly what we did in the old days, saying that let's take data from all these sources, put it into one, uh, one uh, database, call it a data warehouse and do our analytics. So maybe that is the future then <laughs> to go back to that again. Yeah, okay, thank you, I'll stop here. I was thinking maybe Austin, since the two of you had the presentation, maybe we should open for question to all of you guys or you have a comment Austin? yes of course yeah, you have. i was going to i was going to just respond quickly to to the the four previous speakers so thank you very much for uh yeah the um uh comments i, I wanted to start with with pamud and uh, the sleepless nights uh, supporting sri lanka i haven't been yet to sri lanka but i would love to go someday um, so, so i had to support it from, from quite a far away <laughs> um but I think you you highlighted very clearly what is the power of uh, a platform in addressing real needs and real urgent needs um, in public health, but in other in other situations as well. Um, and then Andrew, you you extended on that to say that it's a it's a community. It's a uh, the all of us are sharing our innovations and and working together to address these problems. And that's really I think quite unique and and enabled by that platform as well. Um, I was in Rwanda uh, with you uh, a couple months ago um, with a, a group of 50 people uh, learning about integration. Um, and that touches on the, uh, another point that, that both Mark and Jorn brought up, uh, which is uh, interoperability and integration are a part of that platform and that extensibility and being able to play well with others and get data to where it needs to go. Um, so it was really a powerful uh, experience to be in with 50 people learning about interoperability with DHS2 uh, from 20 different countries or more, um, and then taking a bus across the, the border to, to Uganda to meet with uh, some very uh, talented developers in the network, in the community, working on building extensions and, and adaptations of DHS2. Um, so I think the, the interoperability is a really big part of our uh, focus as well as security and i think that um it was on one of my slides but it, it it's a big uh, focus for us as well is investing in first class support for interoperability and first class support for for top notch security which has sometimes been been an afterthought in in the space where we work um and yeah so interoperability and and complex architectures and and being able to get the data to where you need it to be able to do triangulated angular analytics uh, on that i think is really the the way that we're we're going in the future so looking forward to that journey together that was my quick comment sorry it was a little bit longer no 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 shall we open the, the floor Lars? or you want to comment i can i can just yeah. have one. just do a super quick comment on to build on what uh, mark says and also Jürgen says i think you know, DHS2, we, we really, we do spend a lot of energy building out analytics, right? We have people, you know, working very hard on it. Uh, but the thing is that we also built out very complicated, or not very, but a bit complicated tracker um, systems now where people do, you know, mother and child analysis, this households and the spraying and this whatnot. And, and then the problem is that people come and say, oh, but we can't really analyze this data. You know, we spend all this time putting the data in, but we can't look at it in, in analytics. And I would say that maybe we are putting a, a necessary constraint on the system and, the, and ourselves because the data is there. I mean, the data is there. And there are things like, there, there's a thing called SQL that allows you to query the database to get the data out and display it in a report. That exists, right? So, but still we say, can't be done, right? But it can. So, so I feel like to kind of take some pressure off the dishes to analytics and, you know, save the, the poor guys working on analytics day and night, 
we should be able to also kind of integrate the more ad hoc explorative analysis that we do find today in data warehouses and BI tools uh, in these test two, because it can be done. Is it that we, we say that it can't? Um, I would say that DHS2 is really a fantastic tool when it comes to distributing analysis to many people, right? Um, you know that implementing a data, uh, like a BI tool at scale can be difficult because of training and installation and cost. So like distributing analysis in DHS2 is, is what the, the software does really well. So I think in the future now uh, with the analytics team, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if we can try to combine the power of the kind of DHS2 predefined reports and dashboards and program indicators with the more explorative ad hoc analysis that we can do in, in uh, data warehouses and BI tools together. Thank you, Lars. Any questions, guys and girls from the audience? You have the chance. No hands? Yes, we have one. Pamud is not here for running anymore, so. <laughs> First of all, I just wish to commend you. This, this has been fabulous four days, really eye-opening at all levels. Oh, sorry. My name is Aman Siam. I'm the regional advisor for health information systems um, in the WHO Southeast Asia regional office. I'm responsible for 11 countries. Uh, eight of them are using DHIS2 profoundly and strongly. So, so I, I just wish to commend you on this. Lars, I take your point. We're not going to ask you do this and do that and solutions and whatever. But I need you to help us, please, to, in a way, having like a marketing strategy for DHIS2. So the asks I have is that you have, we are still trapped with the lower and lower middle income thinking for DHIS2. We need to, you know, raise the bar on this. We have a few upper middle income countries who are really in a mess with their facility-based systems. Yeah. And there's something to learn there. So that would have been one thing, of course, to reflect on the fact that it's not just the map and what you drew, it's the socioeconomic groupings that you have gained. And now that you are crossing over from the health to other sectors, you have to take that into account. The second thing is about data sovereignty. I think this is something we need you to package into your marketing. And I have to say, as, as technical agencies, we failed you a bit because I think it should have been our responsibility to market the data itself and the use. We can't expect you to handle the informatics and the public health aspect as well. So, so you, you really provoked us by a lot of what you've said and what Jorn has said. So the two asks are definitely to raise the game, to speak more about upper middle incomes, and what they can learn from. We, DHI tool is not for Africa only or for Asia. Or it, it's really, it has a global dimension of applicability now. Second, the data, the idea that the data sovereignty is always guarded. And then third, I think what I would really ask you to consider given all the collective partners, especially that you have a meeting coming up of the partners, in the sense that the, what I think my colleague from PEPFAR spoke about, the spectrum is increasing. Like for the Southeast Asia now, we have a big issue with dengue. It's again uprising. We still have a big entrapment with TB. So we have to look into cross infection. So for me, the big education I had coming is the capture. The fact that we will definitely want to look at the profile of co-infections. What do they look like? And third, but of course, of course the NCDs. We need more to be done for the NCDs. And in that respect, I want really to come to urge you to have like a Marshall plan to start thinking of patient registries that should be trapped by DHIS2. For instance, cancer. We still are not doing well in analyzing cancer data. And they complain about, we don't have good data. We, you know, it's really hooked into very small places. So I'm just saying that if you can come up a bit more as you say, you focus on quality. This is what, what Austin said, we are going towards quality. It's also speciality, not just quality. We have to show new offerings that we are able to handle patient registries, for instance. That will be a huge asset. You will open up a massive scale of data use if we can trap the new types of users 
beyond what we call the communicable and infectious diseases. So these are four. I said, I'm going to write you an email <laughs> because yeah. I spoke too long. Probably better. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, Norway was actually using DHS2 for contact tracing. So it's not only the, you know, up and, you know, upper and middle in Asia that is a mess. It's also Norway, to be honest. <laughs> we have our own problems here. Yeah? <laughs> uh, but uh, that was more like a comment I felt. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here. Thank you for the comment. Uh, thank you, um, Absalom uh, Mamrima from Malawi. Uh, of course, uh, I just want to appreciate for the good presentation and the ambitious uh, plans for the future of the uh, DHIS2. Uh, my question, I uh, just want to find out if the, uh, this uh, functionality whereby one is able to compare within uh, countries, like in our case, we have uh, uh, bonus because we have some challenges, uh, cross border challenges uh, when dealing with the uh, uh, immunization uh, API, whereby but maybe some uh, uh, there are cross border issues. Uh, one country, let's say we have uh, Mozambique, Zambia, Tanzania, we see we bordering our country. So this this issue of cross-border challenges, and uh, I just want to find out maybe uh, there could be that functionality of uh, linking, uh, that linkage between one country to say within the DHIS2 to say uh, what they are doing in that country and uh, that are bordering our country. Thank you. You could uh, talk about, we have many cross-border uh, projects. We have the Mekong, we have the... A cross-border project, you... yeah. Hello, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have a cross-border project uh, between countries uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, the big, big, big problem uh, with everything that has to do with cross-border is uh, to get a data sharing agreement. Because uh, even though uh, it's about sharing necessary data, for example, transfer referral of patients between the two sides, it seems to be so close to national security, etc., that all the governments are thinking, "Wow, this is this is dangerous." So take it easy. But yes, cross-border uh, movement is very important uh, in in. Uh, I mean the. the in the healthcare. I mean, you have patients moving back and forth. You have malaria. We have a malaria project also in in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, where all the countries agree on 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 uh, surveillance uh, and monitoring uh, malaria on the on the border areas. So yeah. What about the East African Community? Yeah. That, we have uh, the East African community also, but that's uh, that's more like uh, data to uh, shared uh, shared uh, database. It's similar. We have uh, West Africa Health Organization also having that kind of shared data across uh, across uh, countries. So reporting up to a shared database, that's of course uh, should be easier than to actually have cross-border direct exchange of data because it requires less of uh, less agreements on on security uh, of data and and uh, MOUs etc. But yes, we are both both in the East Africa community and West Africa West Africa Health Organization. I think so. Yeah, thank you. I am Tomeka from uh, uh, West Africa. Uh, Oahu, West African Health Organization. And uh, yesterday we shared some experience mm -hmm. on that. And I think so more than the other colleagues in the other uh, regional economic community, West Africa today, this problem of the data sharing agreement or whatever, is not a problem because it, among the countries, no border. The people are just circulating from freely circulating one country for the other. We have a Nigeria, that's all. 
no visa, no anything that required. So the, the challenge become for the health. How, why to do to ensure that so the health the health problem not become the barrier for that free circulation among the people. And we since the Ebola crisis in 2014-2016, we have now a regional platform for the information sharing. And that pl uh, regional platform, we are improving it every day to improve the, the information. That's so it's accessible for any country. That's so the data entry is done in each country, basic epidemic uh, prone disease for the moment. And the, all other countries have access on this. They can uh, do it at the district level. That's so they can localize the points. Now we are putting information on the point of the entry that can be uh, in the GIC uh, module. So that be, uh, the people know where are the people getting entry from the other country and where are the problem? That's so the problem of the, I think so, one of the difficulties in the other countries that so that free movement in the, among the, the country, they become here the problem. That is not problem in the ECOWAS. That's so what we are doing now and working with hospital supporters is to how to improve the platform to be really, today we are working on the, uh, the early warning system on that platform. That's so in any case, notify that a suspected case, you know, how the other countries can take it as alert to uh, activate the mechanism of the prevention for that point of the uh, health security. Thank you. Thank you. Now going 15 minutes into the app competition, so maybe somebody will look at me. Oh, we have a question more. Okay, we can't, can be, be short. <laughs> Pakistan. Well, this is Mustafa Jamal Kazi, um, National Coordinator of Pakistan uh, for TB, HIV, and malaria. Uh, ever since, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I can be a very good manager. Ever since I've joined this assignment and I am keep on very close eye on the DHIS2 and what problems we are facing right now, the sharing of data from the private sector to the public sector, and from public sector to private sector, it seems very, very tough. And every one of them are engaged, not the public sector, but the private sector is quite engaged working in the silos. These needs to be, you know, um, mandatory for the private sectors to share the data with the public sector so that we can integrate it, a proper data space into the entire uh, DHIS system in the CMU. What we have seen so far, it is not happening. And seldomly, you know, they talk too much, but they don't do that. So what I would be requesting that it should be done in later in the spirit. And this is what everyone is in connection with DHIS2 for developing the software and then they uh, you know, manage their data accordingly. I would be suggesting that the public sector is the most, uh, uh, I would say that the, the key and pivotal for all the databases for the uh, partners and supporters to work with it. This is the main problem. And secondly, I would be saying there are some cross-sectoral or multi-sectoral approaches in the DHIS2 is little lacking. We need to do that also, strengthening the multi-sectoral engagements into these diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria are also facing a challenges in uh, blood front transfusions. So this could be the best indicator Well, any patient or anyone who is actually transfused the blood, it should be indicated. So I would be inviting the DHIS2 to come to Pakistan and prepare a software for blood transfusions also, so that we can maintain the data and manage this thing. Thank you very much. I, I can actually try to try to wrap up a few of these different uh... <laughs> By different lines of thinking, um, maybe a little bit, and bring it back to the platform that we were talking about at the beginning as well. Um, data sharing is important, and uh, Mark, you mentioned direct reporting using national systems and not having parallel reporting. I think there's a lot of similarities between that and and cross-border sharing, not necessarily of uh, 
cross-border migration, but of different countries uh, reporting the aggregate data at the end of the day, right, that we want to see to track progress overall. And we see that uh, as something that we're in, investing a lot in uh, as the DHS2 platform as well is in being able to have the um, the ability for multiple uh, multiple systems to come together um, to have the aggregate data from the, the result of a tracker program, for example, you want to get a count out of it at the end of the day, and you want to send that to your national HMIS, and maybe that national HMIS is sending it to PEPVAR or sending it to Global Fund or sending it to the East Africa region or something like this. And there's a lot of, uh, I think, opportunity for us to, to be able to bring that data together in uh, uh, using the, the, the tools that we have and building in integrations also with other systems, because it's not always DHS2. There's a lot of DHS2, but there's many other systems as well. So building interoperability with those systems and being able to uh, combine data from different programs, different countries uh, into uh, somewhere where it can be actionable. So bringing that data together to where it can really be uh, operated on, I think is really valuable um, as a platform. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Just uh, one final comment. So the problem you highlighted, uh, the way the HISP look at it from our approach, it's more socio-technical. So there is so much uh, that the platform, a uh, technology can do, but it's more about uh, the governance that you set up in the country and the way you implement. So especially when you are working cross-sector, uh, a lot of stakeholders are engaged. So, uh, so I mean, like other than looking at what we can do as DHIS2 platform, the technology, it's more about how you approach the problem and work with the government, set up the proper governance and implement in such a way that uh, this cross-sector collaboration is made a reality.